Hello, I'm John Furrier with theCUBE here in theCUBE studios. I'm here for exclusive conversation with the CEO of AWS Amazon Web Services, Matt Garman, CUBE alumni, at, now at the helm of AWS, took over uh, the role and is leading the team. Matt, great to see you. Thanks for, Thanks for having the me. time. Absolutely, happy to be here. We've had many conversations over the years, obviously, you know, this is, the, I think will be our 14th reInvent coming up. Uh, and watch the, watch you, AWS's growth just continue to throw. I remember I wrote the article first with Andy Jassy, trillion dollar baby, I called it the Amazon market. <laughs> Turns out you know, trillion dollar TAMs aren't, are, are real now. So the growth has been phenomenal. And you guys clearly run the, ran the table, gen one, startups, developers, cloud native emerges, applications, the ecosystem, and then digital transformation really got accelerated with COVID. And again, you guys were really a, a generator of value there. And now we're kind of at this next secular trend of generative AI, which is in the news. You guys are all over this uh, and, and really big part of what you're doing. You've mm -hmm. built the foundation, you got the building blocks, you got the higher level services. What's your vision for AWS over the next 10 years? Obviously with this secular trend, it's a market transition, it's a product transition. What are some of the new opportunities uh, emerging that weren't there before Gen AI really hit the main stage. Yeah, thanks, John. And it's a it's it's a great point. It is uh, you know we continue to see fantastic growth, and I think you're right. When you look at um, Gen AI, it presents an enormous opportunity. We think that um, we see the potential for AI and Gen AI in particular to transform almost every single industry and every single customer out there. And uh, and our view and and my view is. Our job at AWS is to help customers and companies be able to take advantage of this incredible technology. And there's a couple of things that I think about um, when customers think about what they need from this. And it starts from a lot of the, the bedrock and foundation of what we've built in AWS to get to this place still is super important as we go forward. And that, that starts with security. Customers have to have a secure platform to build on. It starts with reliability and performance and it, bleeds into how do I have the best cost structure? How do I have access to the best technologies? And how do you make it easy for me to go innovate in this space? And I do think that as you call out, Gen AI, it, it is a totally um, transformative technology that I think is, is growing and iterating at such a rapid pace that our job is to how do we build this platform and provide a, uh, a canvas for customers to come and innovate. And, and that means how do they do processes in a totally different way? How do they innovate and uh, build new customer experiences? How do they reduce costs and improve efficiencies? There is an enormous amount of ability for uh, customers of all sizes, whether they're one person startups, whether they're technology companies, or whether they're regulated industries like healthcare or financial services, to completely remake how they think about their business, how they think about their innovation path, and, um, and, and really how they think about going about their business. And I think, as you mentioned, um, AWS has been core to many of these companies today as they've grown and moved into the cloud. And increasingly, we think that customers, the innovation, the real value that they're going to get out of generative AI going forward, that's going to be differentiated for each of them is going to depend on their own data. It's going to depend on their own IP and how they use that data and IP and protect that data and IP um, uh, to deliver differentiated value to their end customers through generative AI. And so we want to bring generative AI to the customer data, help customers transform their data into a modern architecture, and then really get value out of that to give differentiated experiences for their customers. You know, I've gotten to know you over the years, Matt, and you're like a helicopter. You can, you can go high level and then really quickly get in, into the product details. You can sit with engineers on one, in one meeting and then walk over the next room and sit with CEOs, unique perspective. Uh, what are the opportunities that are emerging that weren't there before Gen AI that you see are possible? Obviously data plays a big role. What are some of those things you're hearing and seeing and what products mm -hmm. or solutions are going to emerge? What do you see specifically? Because this is a unique time mm -hmm. where new things will emerge, new brands will emerge, yep. new capabilities will emerge. What's possible that wasn't gettable prior to Gen AI in your view? Yeah, there, I, look, it, it's, um, I mean, we could probably talk about this for a couple of hours if if uh, if we had the time here. But it's uh, it, it really is incredible the scope uh, of innovation that's possible. Let's take a couple of examples from uh, like healthcare as an example. With customers like Pfizer or GE Health, um, uh, or brand new customers or companies like uh, Evolutionary Scale, who are thinking about how do you take these generative AI models 
and apply them to finding new drugs in a way that was totally different than before. It's, it's an entirely new way of thinking about creating new proteins, creating new molecules, iterating quickly. And you know, I think in that process, if you look at how this was done before, there was a huge amount of time of just thinking about how do I combine molecules and proteins in a different way to solve a different problem. Compe these models are quite good at taking that labeled data and, and understanding, hey, here's a potential molecule that you can go test, here's another one you can go test, and, 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 and iterating on those, and actually creating proteins and molecules that just never existed before. Uh, and, and I think that that has an enormous potential for curing different types of cancer or, or coming up with different health solutions. Um, and there's still a lot of work in there that's, you know, there's, there's still a long path of how do you go through, you know, real like live testing and, and um, validation and things like that. But, but that is one example where that is just the, there are multiple orders of magnitude, more combinations that companies can now test. And they are testing in AWS today by building specialized LLMs and, and models than they've never been able to do before. Um, and, and that is, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And, and hopefully good for all of us and our long-term health as well. So it's, it's pretty exciting of what's going to be possible. One of the things we're seeing on the Cube Research side is, is companies that, hey, solved a problem, whether it's some to do with a database or search or something yeah. in the enterprise that was kind of niche, uh, niche application here. But with a AI, they get an enablement, really, a disruptive enablement opportunity to change the yeah. scope because the applications are taking advantage of these kinds of new infrastructure configurations, scale, automation, um, abstraction away, the complexity, and changing the application layer. And this is driving a huge amount of entrepreneurial activity. You know, mm -hmm. one of the keys to Amazon's early days success was the rise of the developer, easing to deploy yeah. the building blocks, and the startups that became yeah. ecosystem. And you know, I know it's competitive now in the market. Of course, you got the enterprises right after that, and so that's the growth. But now at Gen AI, we're seeing that kind of level of appetite with developers. We're seeing the mm -hmm. entrepreneurial activity, the valuations are high, and certainly the enterprises are becoming entrepreneurial. But let's stick with developers and, and startups. Yeah. How, what gives you the confidence that Amazon can keep that winning formula with developers and startups? You know, I've got the enterprises, but, but developers and startups, they're the key to bring in the new brands, the new capabilities. They're moving faster than ever before. What's, this yeah. is a big part of your growth and what's your what's your confidence level and, and tell us what's your strategy? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, John. And I think we've talked about this before, how I, I really view developers and startups as the the lifeblood of AWS. It's it's where we started back in our roots. And and we always, we learn so much from, from being actively involved in the startup world. In fact, one of my very first things that I did when I took over this job, like I think it was in week two, I went right down to Silicon Valley and met with a bunch of startups for a couple of days and just went deep as to what's working well, what are the things they're excited about, what takes up their time and stops them from being able to innovate more rapidly. And I do think that um, that's one of the things that I, I want us to be able to unblock these uh, incredible entrepreneurs to just innovate more rapidly and m spend less and less time worrying about the muck of, of getting their vision kind of actually out and launched into the world. And, and look, if you if you talk to any developer today, you know a shockingly low percentage of their time is actually spent on coding. And we think that if you if you there it's you know they'll do some coding, but then it's a lot of documentation, it's a lot of testing, it's back testing, it's deployment, it's bug fixing, it's you know there's a whole bunch of stuff that's very different than just coding. And so you know, if you look at the tools that have been built today around generative AI, uh, a big focus has been about how do we think about code suggestions. Um, and, and by the way, Q Developer is really great at giving code suggestions and is, is at the top of the SWB benchmarks and, and many of these things for, for acceptance testing on great code suggestions. And it's just a small part of how we can really unblock this developer community. And so when you go and talk to a developer, they say, you know what, like, I actually enjoy coding and it's great that you're making me more efficient there, but could you also help me uh, check for errors in my code? Can you help me with deployment? Can you help me with documentation? Can you help me with collaboration? So you think, and so what we do is by, by sitting and talking to developers and sitting and talking to startups, you get a lot of that feedback. And I think, um, uh, and, and this is how we think about when we develop tools and capabilities that go and enable our, our developers to move more rapidly. You know, I think that the, the, a, a day in the life of a developer is going to change pretty materially over the next two years where they can focus much more on the things that they love doing and designing software and thinking about cool problems as opposed to the, the blocking and tackling of actually getting code into a production environment. 
And um, and a lot of that is is learning from those startups. And you ask, why do I think we can continue to be successful with those customers? Um, you know, it's because we listen to them and it's because we sit down and it's because we learn from them and we ask those questions of what's painful today. And, and you know, look, this is, uh, this is a secret sauce that I think um, is not secret, but it's actually quite hard to implement and most companies don't do it well, just actually sitting and listening to your customers and not um, trying to project what you want them to say. It's just so because of the product you have, but really listening to what is the thing a customer is telling you and then going back and figuring out how you can uh, innovate and and help solve that problem in a particularly innovative or useful way um, to to really push uh, some of the things that they're doing and help them go faster. And so I, I think that is such a positive flywheel for us. It's uh, incredibly important and it's something that I will personally spend a lot of time on. And I'm encouraging our teams to spend even more and more time on. It's hard to do. I mean, there's a lot of hyperbole out there and conjecture and and you know mm -hmm. statements may that may or not be true uh, about what the capabilities are. So you got to kind of it's mm -hmm. quality and doing it's a lot harder. I agree. But I, I want to just drill down, if you don't mind, on this, because I think the developer sure. equation is huge because that's going to kick in once the silicon and infrastructure gets completely refreshed and, and completely yep. performing. And we'll get to that in a second. But when, when Amazon started, you know, the word heavy lifting, you know, we do a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting, became the narrative. But before that, the proposition was clear. If you were doing a startup, you were a developer, you didn't really know what you were going to build, but you were building, you're tinkering around, you're playing, but you had a, an alternative. I could buy a server, host it, configure it. I mean, yeah. and that cost money and time, and I don't even know what I'm going to build yet. I got my code, I just want to put my credit card yeah. and swipe it. That was the genesis of AWS. What is the equivalent, and by the way, that's a very clear value proposition. Mm -hmm. It's not like, it's, yeah. a, it's a no brainer. Okay, I don't want to spend money, yeah. I'll just go to Amazon. What's the Gen AI version of that? Is it that all that yeah. muck? Is there something clearer from a value yeah. proposition that these startups face today? What is, mm -hmm. what, what is the equivalent? I don't want to put a data center out there. I don't want to buy a box. I just want yeah. to build and code. What's the equivalent pain point that's the obvious Gen AI answer for cloud growth? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of those, John. It's, 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 a, it's a good question. And then look, all the value from before still exists, right? It's still actually a huge pain to go build your own data center. Um, uh, but we add on the capabilities that customers think that they are, are thinking about needing. And, and so let's start with the data. The, the data sets that many of these customers are working with are massive, right? We're talking about exabytes of data that, that folks are looking, thinking about. And they, they need to have a data lake that's high performing, that's high throughput, that has high capabilities and that they can easily use in, in a global environment. There's not, going and building that yourself is, is almost impossible. And even if you think about the security, operational excellence, and performance of the cloud, there is really un, there there is no comparison to the um, to what you get with AWS. And so that is a great um, foundation to going and building AI uh, services and capabilities. Is is that data lake? And S three by far has the the by, by, or by a, a lot has many many more data lakes than anywhere else. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's by far the best place to run those. And then you think about okay, now I want to run uh, and build AI models. And it turns out that building AI infrastructure um, is hard. And actually, even most customers, when you just launch it on EC2, if, so let's say you launch a really large compute cluster, but you just launch it on EC2. Um, it actually is hard to keep that running. Like a lot of these servers, um, whether they're large GPU instances or others, uh, they have higher failure rates, they go in and out, you're trying to get great networking, et cetera. And, uh, uh, and that really um, is hard to to keep in a highly operational way and and make sure that it's going great. You you will go and launch this on something like SageMaker with Hyperpods. We take care of all of that. Uh, SageMaker and Hyperpods make it really easy for you to do regular checkpoints so that you know kind of where your code is. When you see an issue with a node, it'll shut that node down and bring another one up seamlessly and, and auto scale into it. And it makes you have a much 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 more effective training cluster. And then when you're ready to deploy for inference, it makes it super easy to deploy into an inference world into bedrock where you have a serverless application. So you don't have to worry about scaling, you don't have to worry about performance, you don't have to worry about throughput, it just kind of works. And if there's a different model, right, you, there's a new, um, you know, Claude Sonnet 3.5 is currently one of the, the, the best performing models out there in the world. And let's say it launches and you want to take advantage of that. It's an API call to switch over and start using this new model. And if you're doing this on either a place that only has one type of model, Right, and they only have really one model that they support. 
or they don't have this rich set of capabilities, it's actually really hard to go and build the capability that you want. And so um, we're continuing to innovate. If you look, we have um, launched a massive number of new products in this space over the last few months and, and year. And we have a great roadmap ahead. And I think you think about the infrastructure components, you think about the tools, and then you think about all of the partners that we have as part of that. Um, uh, it's there's it's almost a no brainer as to where you're going to come and build the next generation of, of Gen AI product. It's interesting, you know, hearing you talk, I, I just can't help but think about how the progression from web development to SaaS apps emerged. Mm -hmm. And that obviously web, you know, web grew that into the SaaS that became the cloud app ecosystem. What you're getting yeah. at here is that it's not just the box and the data center you don't have to provision. You got hype you got high performance, you have supercomputing capabilities. So That's in right. a way the apps are scaled applications. This is the new entrepreneurial startup. I mean, you mentioned healthcare and dealing with molecules. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what we're looking at here is essentially scaled apps, not SaaS apps. So SaaS, so it goes from SaaS to scale. I mean, this used to be a very niche, high performance computing paradigm for the Boeings of the world, figuring out wing design. Yeah. Now you're bringing that to the masses. You're basically saying supercomputing for the masses. I mean, that's my word, but you didn't say that. But the apps, a startup can actually build a scalable app. Three people in a garage could could do it. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's exactly right. You can build a a thousand node GPU cluster with terabits of networking in between, and you can do that from a garage. You have to have a lot of funding still, but uh, so you know, you should probably have some VC funding before you get to that <laughs> level of scale because it still is you know that compute is expensive. Um, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's absolutely um, uh, available um, and easy to to get to by um, by startups and and enterprises and and individuals and governments and um, and everyone and so it's it, it is that democratization of high performance computing and and having um, really really powerful compute to be able to go and innovate and build interesting things. Yeah, because solving hard problems are now on the table. Let's get into the uh, silicon. You know, your business is clearly yeah. at AWS, still growing, great results. Congratulations, big part of the earnings uh, piece. Very much the product continues to thunder away and the growth. IaaS still strong, database, data is going to be a big mm -hmm. part of it. Uh, and then obviously the application is going to be more intelligence from scaled apps to re retrofitted SaaS apps. But right now all the action is it's, is in the hardware. It's cool to be a hardware nerd or an infrastructure nerd because there's a lot of work going on because that's where the performance gains are coming at major mm -hmm. step functions. So silicon advancements, XPUs, and, and mm -hmm. training inference, reinforced learning, all part of this new gen AI, AI fabric. Um, you know, on our side, we've been tracking a lot of that market share, and, and but specifically we're, we're seeing compute jump out. We're projecting mm -hmm. on our research team that compute, uh, not just GPUs, will be a dominant factor for inference. The kill, some say the killer app for, um, for uh, generative AI. You know, machine learning, all everything else is in there, but inference becomes what you've learned from training. It's like going to school. I go to school, I learn stuff, and then I infer it, and I re refine myself with my knowledge. Yeah. This is what's going on. Inference is key. Do you agree? And then how do you see that going? And what's your plans around inference? Yeah. Uh, well, look, absolutely. I mean, in fact, like all of all of the money and effort and folks that that people are spending on building these large training models don't make sense if there's not a huge amount of inference on the on the back end to to actually go and build interesting things. I think no one, uh, there's nothing actually interesting that comes from from training. It's only the inferences where you get actual end value, uh, and so so we do think that that is going to be a huge part of it. And in fact, I, I believe that inference is going to become an integral building block into every single application that people. Um, make out there. And just like you have storage and just like you have compute and just like you have database, you're going to have inference as a key part of what you do. And, and you're right, the compute is a key piece of underlying that inference. And, and you know, we think about, um, when we think about inference, there's a couple of things you want to think about. One is uh, what you're trying to, like the complication and, and the task that you're trying to do and how hard is it um, and what is the latency requirement and the um, the cost that you're willing to do for that inference. And I think you want to take a bunch of these different factors and you want to be able to support all of these. Sometimes you have a, a relatively low value um, inference uh, that you would like to deliver. And so you don't want to pay a lot for that. And you're going to want to have, uh, and and it's pro you're probably going to want those, oftentimes those uh, equate to also inference that needs to happen very quickly. And not always, but, but oftentimes. And so sometimes you're going to want these very small models that can uh, answer questions quickly, 
uh, and cheaply, but give a lot of value to an application and, and have a real-time nature. Um, other times, you're going to want an answer that you maybe don't need right away. Think about a like a, a, a software developer example that we were using before, where you might say something like, I want you to plan out uh, you know, how you would go about building this application. It's okay for the computer to think for a minute or two or three even on that, right? And you actually want the absolute best, most thoughtful, detailed model to really be thinking about a problem like that. Same for go and build a, a new um, cancer or a new like protein molecule to go after cancer. That's a problem that it's okay if it takes a couple of minutes or frankly, hours, right? To come back to and really come up with something new. Um, whereas you can imagine if it's something that's in a SaaS app where you're trying to do a chat application or answer a question and, and you have real time interaction, that needs to be really rapid, but it also doesn't take nearly as much thought and reasoning behind it. Do you oftentimes come up with the answer? And so you're gonna want a variety of compute uh, infrastructure is going to want a variety of models under the covers to provide that inference. And so getting back to your, your point about hardware, that is a huge enabler on this front. And there's a couple of pieces that we think about. And we think about infrastructure broadly, not just chips, I think. Um, and But part of what we think is that customers also are going to need choice on inference. And, uh, and they're going to want, um, sometimes they're going to want to be using things like GPUs. And, and today, the vast majority of AI is done on NVIDIA GPUs, and NVIDIA is a fantastic partner of ours. But uh, GPUs are not just GPUs. I think the operation of the GPUs inside of a cl uh, cloud is incredibly important. And I think there's a reason that NVIDIA picked AWS to run their own ML models and applications um, is because our operational excellence is, is much better. The servers have a much higher uptime. The networking is much more scalable and much more performant. And that that actually adds a lot to the performance of the models. Um, and so for a long time, we're gonna be um, have a great NVIDIA partnership in business. We're gonna keep innovating on that front. We increasingly think though, that there are a lot of models that could benefit from lower cost, um, high performance custom made parts that are very focused on just AI and ML. And this is our Tranium and Inferentia uh, line of, of offerings. And you know, we first launched uh, Inferentia, which is our very first um, uh, ML-focused chip. Uh, it's been several years now, probably five or so years. I, can, I might get that a little bit wrong, but um, uh, and you know, it was our first version, and we saw immediately benefits of uh, our own internal teams. I'll use the example of Alexa, moved all of their inference over to Inferentia and saved seventy percent of their costs um, while increasing performance. And so we knew at that point that we were onto something and that there were some real benefits that if we could go build custom made, um, processors that we could deliver real material benefits in, in price and performance. And so, um, the, the next line of processors and chips that we went after is, is Tranium, uh, which is, which is really focused on training. And so, um, training, uh, Tranium one, uh, is out there and is being used by a number of customers and, and I think a lot of the focus on some of our very early customers, folks like uh, Ninja Tech and folks like uh, Anthropic and others are really helping us to get that software stack um, into a great place and get that performance where it needs to be. And they are seeing really great um, performance gains once they do that. And they're actually seeing really, really strong performance on on training, on Tranium. And, uh, and we've announced that Tranium 2 will be coming out um, uh, later at the end of this year. And, uh, and we're incredibly excited about the performance there. And that's where I think if you saw, you know, originally we started our, our custom silicon path with Graviton and our general purpose processors. And, you you know, if you remember back in the day, I'm sure you do, Graviton 1, it was exciting, but it wasn't like earth shattering from a processor perspective, right? And it was, but it was a lot of, but people were excited about it. And there was a lot of early adoption on it, getting the software stack in place because they could see where that was going. Today, fast forward to today, we have Graviton 4. Um, you know, customers of all shapes and sizes are moving vast swaths of their compute onto Graviton 4 because it delivers materially 20, 30, 40% better price performance than x86 platforms. It uses less power, they deliver less cost, they get better absolute performance. Um, and people have loved that. And I think the Tranium you'll see is on a similar, will be on a similar trajectory where the first one, lot there's been a lot of early adoption by customers. They're very excited about it. Uh, and, you know, you're going to see that step change uh, growth uh, in performance uh, as we continue with future generations. So excited about that. And I think it um, the combination of having both NVIDIA as well as a really great Tranium platform, um, uh, as, long, as well as uh, Inferentia for Inference, um, I think it's going to give customers some fantastic performance and, and really drop the cost um, of doing Inference over time.
Yeah, Gen AI is really hungry for processing and its for performance is huge. You know, mm -hmm. it reminds me, I mean, I think we're seeing a systems revolution right now in the general market. Gen AI has brought a lot of conversations to the table that frankly were reserved for things like open compute, um, supercomputing mm -hmm. conferences, people that were in the weeds, uh, deep in the chips and the silicon and the performance. You guys pioneered, I do remember the, the day I first saw the Annapurna's first chip, uh, I mm -hmm. think it was Graviton, it was really small, but you guys pioneered um, the systems architecture of what's around mm -hmm. the chips and then the software stack around it to get the scale. I remember we had those conversations yeah. on theCUBE. That's now mainstream and, and, and the use cases are so diverse that you never know what you're going to need. So I think the, the question mm -hmm. comes up now is it's not just the, the GPU, it's the GPU, it's the CPU, mm -hmm. it's what's around it and how you guys did that. You guys have been doing this for years. What's different yeah. now with the, that system that you guys are building? Because like I said, it's a supercomputing now option. Yeah. That's for the masses. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, around, it's what's around the chips and, and the software stack's critical. And mm -hmm. one other point I want to get your thoughts on, and second part is we're seeing a trend where the best AI applications on the cloud are really mm -hmm. coding closer to the kernel. We're almost seeing mm -hmm. a, a comeback of of uh, yeah. assist uh, yeah. machine coding. And, and, I, and yeah. I say that not that they're chip developers, and mm -hmm. the ISV world and yeah. startups are moving down to this abstraction as close to the hardware and chip and the software stack as possible. Yep. And so this is a trend we're seeing. Do you see that trend happening? Because this is not your, you know, yesterday's yep. hardware developers. These are yep. software people. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'll take both parts of that question. The first thing is the system around around making sure these work. Um, actually, if you'll remember, our first chip that we delivered was actually the the Nitro controller, and and thinking about the whole like Nitro set. And so it wasn't even a customer visible chip; it was a chip for the system, right? And we very quickly, and or long ago, uh, more than a decade ago, when we first had the Annapurna team come and join us, we realized that that building custom silicon in order to build a custom uh, network and hypervisor virtualization layer was incredibly important. And that's how we get line rate networking. It's how we get better performance of, of storage. We virtualize all of those in this, um, in our, uh, in our nitro system and, and we get much, much better performance. And, you know, I think John, it's super interesting. That is a capability that is still unique to AWS and is a differentiator even today. And so, um, you know, that fact that we have that nitro security layer and that performance layer is still differentiating and is something that that other clouds don't have. And it is a security benefit that, that many of those security conscious customers that we have really focus on and, and love that, that Nitro security layer. And so that system is super important. The other part of that though, is it helps us optimize um, our performance. And when you're thinking about um, AI and you're thinking about these really large systems, as you say, they're complicated. They are, they're effectively large HPC systems from, from back in the day, but focused on, on, um, uh, ML accelerators and and large compute clusters, and uh, and network is a, a critical part of that. I think a, a lot of when you get into some of these large training runs, in particular, customers think about how do they actually get the most throughput out of that cluster, and some of that is they need the most bandwidth and the, and the lowest latency in between these nodes, and things like InfiniBand, which um, were quite popular, um, some of the other clouds kind of glommed on to using InfiniBand, but the problems with InfiniBand is it doesn't scale at the rate you need. It's very fragile. It's expensive and it's not like, and and so we've long ago invested in unique differentiating network capabilities around ethernet because yeah. we we long believed these things are going to be able to need to scale bigger. They're going to need to be reliable and operable and, uh, and InfiniBand just didn't have those characteristics. And ethernet, we saw like there was work to do and we had made a huge investment and we've invested here over the last decade. Yeah. And now we get better performance out of our ethernet networks um, than you can on a large InfiniBand network. And so that um, those investments, and we have things like EFA and our own protocols that that kind of help us get that low latency, high throughput performance that customers need in um, inside of a cloud world. Yeah, now that's a good call by the way, because ethernet was a good call because it's only getting faster and it's also standard and it's open ecosystem. So it, right. you have much more performance coming down the pike and everyone's using it. <laughs> it's like yeah, we we always like to bet on open. It's just, you know, it's a, I think it's a good bet, and uh, and long term we like to go bet on that. So um, so you know, I, I think it's a it's it's a good path for us to go down. All right, ISV is moving closer to the hardware. This is a big trend. Do you see that happening? Hundred uh, percent. I think that look, 
Um, it's super interesting as you talk to some of these really deep, particularly the model builders, by the way, a little, I think a little bit less on the application side. I don't see it as much when the people are just doing inference or kind of building it into SaaS apps and others like that. But when you talk to these, these folks that are really building their own models, whether they're building foundational models or they're building kind of fine-tuned models on top of either open source or specialized for a, a particular area, like I mentioned in, in, um, uh, in medical space, uh, they are getting deep into that and they are really thinking about um, down to the kernel level how they optimize uh, performance to these chips. And so uh, we're thinking about how we give people better access to that. And I think that's one of the, um, you know, if you if you fast forward 10 years ago, um, we uh, launched the ability for customers to, to upload custom kernels into EC2. Um, and that unblocked a very small slice of customers that were doing really cool, large things and enabled them to do stuff they wouldn't have otherwise done in the cloud. Um, I, uh, I would expect that we'll do something very similar to that uh, in this space to enable um, these large model builders to be able to make tweaks and make changes that are down at the, the kernel level. Infrastructure is the game of the game right now. And then once infrastructure yep. you know, kind of crosses over and we're there right now with you guys and it's going to continue to get better, that's going to change the game on the data and then the intelligent application side. And uh, one tell sign mm -hmm. here that we're seeing is your partners, right? So. Um, how is the partner relationships going? Your ecosystem is very yep. robust. You guys are doing some, some of your own solutions. I've seen some of that, but still got the ecosystem going on. The alliances, the partnerships. We saw Deloitte's got their own custom lab. We covered that in New York. Um, mm -hmm. So Matt Wood and the team there, we, we, we talked to those Great. folks. What's going on with the partners? How are they evolving? Yep. Um, obviously they're picking up the slack on the go-to-market, helping customers learn, but what's yep. how are they using it? What are they building? Um, how are yeah, they? It's, it's, Developing. It's a it's a, it's a, it's a great um, it's a great call out. Uh, partners have been front and center. We knew that from the very beginning of starting AWS, probably from the first year, that that partners were going to be super critical for us to really get the broad adoption that we've wanted. And I would say every year since that first year, we've doubled down and and been more convicted that that's the right way to go. Um, and so if you think about the AI space, um, you know, if you go and talk to um, a, a more traditional enterprise, they may don't they maybe don't have some of these deep technology teams that that today's technology does require, right? And and over time, I think hopefully Gen AI is more accessible and more accessible and 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 it's easier for less technical folks to take advantage of and, and innovate on. But today, many customers need help, and they need help getting their data in the right place. They need help with labeling. They need help with um, organizing applications and really implementing security controls and thinking about how they go and, and really gain enterprise value from, from AI and generative AI. And our partner um, ecosystem is incredibly important for that. And so folks like Accenture and Deloitte and Slalom and, and our, our great set of, of SI partners um, are, are hugely important in, uh, in helping to drive that with customers, as well as our ISV partners who can come in and add capabilities with um, you know kind of pre-built in uh, applications. And so you think about somebody like a, a Salesforce or a ServiceNow or a Workday that are all kind of building on top of AWS and they have that AWS uh, AI and, and capability of Gen AI built into their applications and both the ability to, to custom innovate. You have somebody like an SAP that actually has Bedrock built into SAP so you can build custom applications inside of SAP. Um, and, uh, and I think, so there's all sorts of those, th that range of partners that are incredibly important for a, a broad set of customers to really get value out of generative AI. Where today they may not have the technical teams or the know-how um, to go and, and really get the value that they want. It's interesting, it's still early innings and even with all the hype of the AI, mm -hmm. Your guys' growth has been phenomenal. I would say the percentage of revenues have shifted a little bit between some of the categories of IaaS and PaaS, because machine learning and database and analytics are in there too. We're going to probably see more of that, um, but that's just mm -hmm. the nature of the game. Uh, and, and then again, we think it's going to unleash uh, more growth on the app side as that hits, and that will certainly yeah. change the ecosystem of the partners. Um, but this is an opportunity for you. I mean, you're taking the helm, you know, Dave and I were calling you the Bill Belichick to Bill Parcells on our <laughs> podcast, because um, you and Andy have had a great relationship. You've been running EC2, you know a lot about Amazon. You've been the, an Amazonian, and this is in your blood. As you look out on the next phase, this next era of AWS with you at the helm, there's more competition. Um, you didn't really have much because you were competing against data centers, which was an easy win in my opinion. You, you probably won't admit that, but I, that's what I see. Uh, but now, now the game is still a huge opportunity because of the growth. There's a huge inflection mm -hmm. point. We just talked about that. 
What's, yeah. what's your leadership style? How, how's the culture at AWS? There's a lot of discussion around, you know, Amazon going back to their roots, everything's day one, uh, still day mm -hmm. one. You guys have an enormous impact on the industry, also your culture, working back from the customer. What's, what, what is your leadership style and what's, what's the state of the Amazon Web Services culture? Yeah, I, look, uh, the couple things I would say on that is, is one is um, uh, we want to lead with the, the best products that are out there in the market and we want to make sure that we're just enabling our customers to innovate at the rate that they um, that they possibly can. And so my, my look, I'm super lucky. I have an incredibly talented team that I've inherited and we have some of the smartest people in the world here working in AWS to go build these services for customers. And so my job is to, to let them invent, to help them and enable them to be in an environment where they can move fast, build interesting things and build products for our customers. And so I think it has to be kind of a product first approach where we really think about how do we help customers in this, the, the landscape is only getting more complicated, it's only changing more rapidly. And so we have to make sure that we innovate and help them um, help them understand that space and, and move quickly. And so, so um, you know, I, I really just think about, um, from my perspective, just enabling that team. Like we have a fantastic team and, uh, and just like, uh, you know, to use your analogy, uh, Bill Belichick never won a game, right? It was the team that was on the field that won the game. And so uh, similarly, like my job is to help make sure that the fantastic team we have here at AWS can can run fast, listen to our customers, uh, innovate, iterate, and uh, and continue to to help customers get more value. And, and when that happens, um, you know, we have a, a saying here that we never obsess about our, our competitors, we obsess about our customers. And, um, you know, I think that's the, that's the absolute right focus because if we do the right thing for our customers, we help them get value and we help them move rapidly, uh, the right things will happen for the business. Yeah, I mean, it's a team sport, I totally agree. When you have all hands meetings, what's the, what's the message? What, what do you say, take that hill, we got to get back in the Gen AI game. I mean, I know you don't look at the shiny new toy because you have a very technical background and you understand the business well at, at, at AWS. What is the mm -hmm. message when you have the all hands meeting, when you send out the email to the team or you have the meetings? What, what's, what's the Matt Garman uh, mantra for the team? Well, look, there's, there's a couple of things that I would say. One is, um, it is a sense of urgency. I think that uh, the opportunity that you call out is, is massive for us and it's massive for our customers. And um, every day matters in the, in the speed of, of which technology is changing. And so one of the messages that I have for the team is just that speed matters. And so having that urgency, having that bias for action to push things forward, and, and not get bogged down in the minutia, but really think about what's important, optimize and go after the most important things first, I think is, is one of those messages that uh, I really try to emphasize with, with the team out there. I think the other thing, and it's a super important message for us, which is, um, you know, it's super, and you mentioned it's it's easy to get distracted by the shiny new thing. And and Gen AI is the shiny new thing. And, and it's not just a shiny new thing though. It is a transformational technology that is super important and it's super important for today and for our customers and the, for the future of the business and everything we do. And that business is not going to be at all successful if we don't have the absolute best compute platform, the absolute best storage platform, the absolute best set of databases, the richest set of analytics capabilities, the absolute best performing network, and far and away the best industry security um, uh, that anyone else has out there. And so that is also the message is not to lose track of how important those key building blocks are for our customers. And we have to keep innovating on those fronts as well. And so, um, you know, I think if we can keep pushing on all of those angles and drive that innovation on the Gen AI layer to make sure that customers can get, take advantage of that new technology, um, I think we'll be in a pretty good spot. Yeah, the market and markets in transition, but also the product and platforms are in transition. It's a growth opportunity. Matt, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your super busy schedule to sit down with me in the cube uh, to share your thoughts on, on what's coming. I know reInvent, you kind of save all some good stuff for reInvent, so you kind of, I won't say hiding the ball a little bit. <laughs> I, but can't, I can't tell you all the things <laughs> right now. You got to have some things for, uh, for December. That's right. Yeah, final question for you before you, you go. Uh, we talked to a lot of people and they're really looking at a generational reset on their infrastructure their platform, mm -hmm. they want to build that foundation, no cracks that, to, to build, bring in this next era, whether it's retrofitting end-to-end -end applications that they mm -hmm. currently have with yeah. Generative AI, as well as build new native Generative AI. So they're looking at everything, okay? Complete mm -hmm. reset. Um, what's your advice to them? These are platform architects, these are le senior leaders. Uh, what's yeah. your advice to them as they look at the cloud as that option, because they're your customers, yeah. the, big, the big whales out there. What is your advice to them? What's the pitch? What would you say to those folks? 
Look, there's the the, the point number one is that it, 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 a lot of these customers are still running on premise today, and you're not going to take advantage of all of these great new technologies that are out there um, if you don't actually go through the work to modernize and, and migrate to the cloud. Of long said, if you take the absolute best AI model out there and point it at a mainframe, you're not going to get fantastic results. You've got to get all of your applications and data and modernize into a cloud to really be able to get that agility and get that scale and get things going. And so, you know, point number one is you are not going to get the benefits of the, the technology path going forward, staying in a traditional data center. And then point number two is you're still going to want to make sure that when you get to that spot, you are in the absolute best place that gives you the most security and most operational performance and the widest set of features. And and it's not, look, it's, it's not rocket science to think about those things, but there's an easy choice there. There is absolutely one cloud, which is AWS, that gives you the best security. And we have a long track record of doing that. Um, and it's because we start from the very beginning of thinking about security in every single thing that we do. We also have by far the best operational excellence. And when customers are going to entrust these core applications to us and their next generation of applications, they need a provider that they can trust has a great operational track record. And AWS is far and away the best there. And then part three is they just want to make sure that they have access to the absolute best technology. Yeah. And whether they're the best chips, whether it's the best experience in operating in their industry, and whether it's the best set of databases or storage or ML capabilities or models, AWS is also that. And so you look at all those together and it's kind of, an, an, an in my view, um, continues to be that AWS is the right place to move and we'll continue to help customers on that journey and path. And, um, and, and that's the last thing I'd say is the relationship matters. And we view it as a partnership with our customers and uh, we lean in with them to help them all be successful. Uh, and I think that matters a lot too. Applications are getting smarter with Gen AI. Devices are getting smarter with Gen AI with the data and inference. And it's a systems revolution. Matt, thank you so much for your time uh, here Thanks, speaking with me and on your very busy schedule. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. Have a good day. Matt Garman, the CEO of AWS here on theCUBE, breaking it down. Getting into detail on this systems revolution, Amazon's next era led by Matt Garman and the team. Going back to the roots of AWS, developers of startups and large scale enterprise. Scalable applications are coming, more data, and there's a whole nother revolution coming and Amazon's well, well positioned for the cloud, according to Matt Garman. I'm John Furrier, theCUBE, thanks for watching.